It is good morning. It is Monday, November 19th, and this is The Drill. So, good morning. This is uh, Ron. Thank you very much. Uh, This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America today, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. And this is the show that's uh, not for the uh, philosophers, uh, you know, the PhDs, the master's degree people, the professors, the doctors, the lawyers. It is for the butchers, the bakers, and the candlestick makers. It's also further for the for the for the people that may like to listen to uh, conservative talk radio, but find it wanting, find that it is missing something, and uh, that's what the show is really about. Is about filling in those blanks. So. Um, a lot of people are are talking to me and they say, you know, Ron, I uh, read Ayn Rand and um, I'm getting into this, into philosophy and I'm studying this stuff and I find myself with uh, a lot of anxiety. Uh, I become very anxious. I become almost panicky and, um, you know, wanting to know, is this normal and is is there something that can be done about it? And um, so... Uh, there's two reasons for for being coming anxious and uh, panicky. One of them is because you're you're getting overwhelmed. You uh, it happens to me when I read Ayn Rand to this day. You know I've been reading her uh, material over and over and over again, her nonfiction works for at least the past ten years. And when I first started out, I'd get really ambitious and I'd read uh, try to read a whole chapter, and then I'd get to that anxiety, almost panicky standpoint because what she has to say is very deep. When you read, it's eye-opening. When you read what she has to say, it's it really hits you right between the eyes. And you can easily become overwhelmed. So I find that by simply putting uh, her material aside, or whatever it is that I happen to be reading, because I can have that experience uh, reading Mortimer Adler or any of the introducing series, introducing philosophy, introducing ethics, that kind of thing, and uh, just put the material aside uh, until the anxiety uh, subsides and I'm uh, able to get back to that material and uh, pick up where I left off. The second way that you're going to end up with anxiety is because uh, by design. So you have the one way, which is by accident. Um, You've uh, basically bitten off more than you can chew or by design. And by design, I mean the left. The left wants to create uh, anxiety amongst uh, particularly people that want to learn and um, particularly, and people that want to have discussions, debates, and to have those discussions and debates in good faith. The left's dogma is that um, socialist paradise is inevitable. It's inevitable because Karl Marx says it is. So, um, and since it's inevitable, there's nothing to debate or discuss. We all want paradise. We all want the same things, so why do we need to bother having debates or discussions? Let's put those debates and discussions aside and just get on with the the work of creating socialist paradise. Unfortunately for them and for everybody, they don't have socialist paradise, only socialist hell. That's the only thing they really have to offer. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, no thank you. But in any case, uh, the point what they do, instead of just telling you flat out, don't argue, don't debate because they know that's not going to work, is they get into your psyche and and get you to quit on your own. And the way they do that is with is what I call the what-if scenario. They get you to worry. And we usually worry about nothing. But uh, if you say, for instance, and I've, I've gone over this before, but if you go, uh, I'm going to go to my boss and I'm going to confront him about X, Y, Z. Then they say, but what if he reprimands you? But what if he... Uh, fires you. Well, then I'll sue him. But what if you lose the lawsuit? What if you can't find a lawyer? What if... And the what ifs never end. And then you you answer that question. You answer one question, there's another what if behind it. You answer another question, another what if, and on and on and on and on and on. And also what they're doing with this, with this what if scenario, is trying to convince you that life is uh, like a poker game, you know, that might makes right and the ends justify the means, that 
people might do anything. Hey, what if you, you I go to your, my boss and I'm going to confront him about X, Y, Z. Well, what if he gets up and hits you in the face? What if he just stands up and punches you? What if he beats the crap out of you? Well, then I'll sue him. Well, then what if he goes out and gets a gun and decides he's going to kill you because you sued him? See, and it's to convince you that you can't win. You can't win, so you don't. And eventually, what happens is you quit talking. You just don't. You don't say much anymore. Not only that, but it's it becomes a situation where you start taking this seriously. And every time you're thinking about doing something, you go start going through what if scenarios. What if this happens? Well, what if that happens? Well, what if I say this? What if she says that? If I go to my wife and confront her about something, what if she gets a divorce or demands a divorce? And what is missing here and the way out of the what-if scenario is ethics, morality. The question isn't, what if he does it? The real question is, well, and if somebody asks you, let's say, they, what if your boss uh, gets pissed off and he's going to uh, try to beat the crap out of you? Then the way you deal with that is you say, why would he do that? Ta-da! And, and or you say, well, that's not the question. The question is, what should he do? Okay, we're all moral agents. Whether we like it or not, and whether we acknowledge it or not, we're all moral agents. There are those of us in um, that operate with different moral codes, child molesters, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is, we're all moral agents. And if you doubt it, look at what goes on in prisons. Read about it. Prisons are, uh, penitentiaries are, uh, societies amongst, uh, within themselves. And there are rules in prison. Not, not just talking about the rules that are made by the warden and by the prison guards, but the rules that are made by the prisoners themselves. Okay, and there's a uh, Fresh Out is, is a YouTube series, and uh, it's excellent. It's about a guy. It's the experiences of being in prison. It was a, a guy that uh, went wrong and uh, ended up doing uh, ten years in a federal uh, penitentiary. But he comes out and he's trying to educate people and let them know what prisons really like, so that they're not going to make the same mistake he did. Very uh, laudable, and uh, he also makes a pretty decent living on the side while he's doing it. You know, because he's got a lot of hits on his YouTube page, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic. The American dream. There you go. Turning turning disaster into, uh, or turning lemons into lemonade. Fantastic. Absolutely fabulous. But anyways, the point is that if you listen to his stories, you're going to really realize that in prison, they got rules. That the prisoners have their own rules. They have their own morality, their own ethics. Uh, again, if you're a child molester, you're at the bottom and a, and a sort of a caste system. The people that are high, held in higher esteem versus the people that are held in low esteem. Child molesters, rapists, people like that are at the bottom of the uh, totem pole, so to speak. And uh, one of the things that was interesting that they said is that when you go to the cafeteria in prison, they say no smacking. You don't, you don't chew with your mouth open. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> well, anyways, so you you would think that all of these people are, are social misfits, so they go to prison and that they'd all be just acting whatever way they wanted to, whenever they wanted to. You don't. The difference, also the difference in prison is if you, you make mistakes, you get punished for it. And a lot of times the punishment that you're going to get from fellow prisoners is going to be a hell of a lot more severe than what you're going to get at the hands of the justice system. But the point is that we all have uh, rules and ethics. We're all moral agents. It's inescapable. So the quest question again when you get what if is, why? Why would that happen? Or you can again tell that person that's trying to worry you, well, um, that's not the question. The question isn't what if he does it, but what should he do? When I go to my boss and I confront him about this, what he should do is look at himself and realize that what he's doing is wrong and correct his mistake. That's what he should do. Okay. 
And But again, the whole point is to get you demoralized and depressed behind the idea that there's no way you can win. Once you take it out of a winning and losing situation and put it into a right and wrong scenario or outlook, you get rid of all that. And you get rid of the anxiety and the panic that goes with it. So when I come back, I'm going to be reading from the Ayn Rand lexicon. Thank you very much. The Ayn Rand lexicon. Uh, she's dealing with important concepts and uh, that uh, help people to understand her fiction and nonfiction uh, works better. And today's entry is contradictions. A contradiction cannot exist. An atom is itself, and so is the universe. Neither can contradict its own identity, nor can a part contradict the whole. No concept man forms is valid until he integrates it without contradiction into the total sum of his knowledge. To arrive at a contradiction is to confess an error in one's thinking. To maintain a contradiction is to abdicate one's mind and to evict oneself from the realm of reality. Objectivism agrees with Aristotle's formulation of the law of non-contradiction. These truths hold good for everything that is and not for some special genius apart from others. And all men use them because they are true of being qua being. For a principle which everyone must have who understands anything that is, is not a hypothesis. Evidently, then, such a principle is the most certain of all which principle this is, let us proceed to say. It is that the same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject and in the same respect. The law of identity, A is A, is a rational man's paramount consideration in the process of determining his interests. He knows that the contradictory is the impossible, that a contradiction cannot be achieved in reality, and that the attempt to achieve it can lead only to disaster and uh, destruction. Therefore, he does not permit himself to hold contradictory values, to pursue contradictory goals, or to imagine that the pursuit of a contradiction can ever be to his interest. The classic case of contradiction is um, skepticism. Okay, the skepticism says nothing can be known with certainty, ignoring the fact that the statement I, it, I just made is a statement of certainty, is therefore a contradiction, and therefore it, it, the whole idea is null and void. <clears throat> so, um, when we come back, um, well, the next word in this uh, next concept is cooperation, but that'll be for uh, next time. Back in a minute. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming back here and um, let's see. So I'm going to be reading again from the ten books uh, that screwed up the world and five that didn't help by Benjamin Weicker, and we're at the uh, section in uh, the chapter on Rousseau uh, called Aristotle, the Man of Wisdom and Experience. Hold on a second, let me see. Let me see something. Nope, that was the wrong one. This is the right one. Uh, so anyways, here we are. We're at Rousseau. Um, let's see. Okay, let's uh, go, go with this paragraph. But society is not just unnatural, it's actually bad. As Rousseau made clear in his first discourse, the development of society, the development of the human being beyond mere isolated animal existence, constitutes man's fall from idyllic, original natural happiness into the morbid, vicious, entangling miseries of civilization, a tragic descent from natural freedom to artificial servitude. Everyone must see, says Rousseau, that the bonds of servitude are formed only from the mutual dependence of men and the reciprocal needs that unite them. But in the state of nature, each man is entirely independent. The artificial chains of society, quote, did not exist in the state of nature, unquote, therefore, 
Quote, each man there was free of the yoke, unquote. We are not far from Marx and Engels' famous cry that closes the Communist Manifesto. Quote, the Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Unquote. There are, of course, important differences with Marx. Rousseau believed that because the advance of civilization, including the advance of technology, i.e. the arts, caused our misery, then the only way to progress was to go backward, to recreate as best one could the conditions condition of the undeveloped human animal, shaking off the artificial chains of society and returning to the purity of nature. For Marx and Engels, by contrast, the progressive conquering of nature and the stages of society that arise from it lead forward to a peaceful communistic utopia where technology provides an Edenic uh, existence in which no one has to labor. Rousseau and Marx lead in opposite directions, one back and the other forward. What for Rousseau was a sign of decay became for Marx a sign of progress. That having been said, Rousseau is still the father of Marxist thought, although we'll have to work a bit to show the connections. In the beginning, the man-animal owned nothing. Rousseau assures us he had no idea of property because he had no idea of anything. He was entirely non-rational. His soul, agitated by nothing, was given over to the sole sentiment of its present existence without any idea of the future, unquote. He was blissfully living a life of, quote, pure sensations, unquote. He ate when he was hungry, slept when he was tired, and he had duty-free sex when the mood struck him. In this original state, so Rousseau claims, there were plenty of acorns and apples for everyone. No, no thing belonged to anyone. Nobody belonged to anyone. Each did as he wished, and since he wished for so little, there were no conflicts, and no anxious toiling. Things would have gone on this way indefinitely if not for a first revolution. Some fool got it into his head to build a hut. And even worse, instead of running off after he'd conquered a woman, he invited her into his shelter. This produced the establishment and differentiation of families and a sort of property, a distinction of mine and thine that never existed. Things slid quickly downhill from there, whereas the natural man was originally free, he became unnaturally tied down to a place and family. As more families gathered, divisions of labor arose, allowing for the creation of both necessities and luxuries and assuring social interdependence. At this point, the decline of man is already well on its way. The first revolution brings both virtue and vice. In the state of nature, sexual fidelity did not exist. But when a woman is labeled as one man's own, adultery is created where before was sexual freedom. From luxury came dissipation and vice. No one was a glutton before a surplus of food existed. From possession comes crime. No one could steal, therefore, uh, before there was a concept of ownership. And there was no ownership prior to the doleful invention of architecture and agriculture. From interdependence came inequality. All were equal when there were no distinctions based on labor, ownership, or comparison. It would seem, then, that claiming something as one's own, private property, is the origin of all human misery, and, to recall the title of Rousseau's treatise, of all inequality. Quote, the first person who, having fenced off a plot of ground, took it into his head to say, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. What crimes, wars, murders, what miseries and horrors would the human race have been spared by someone who, uprooting the stakes or filling in the ditch, had shouted to his fellow men, Beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits belong to all and the earth to no one. The implications of all this were picked up by Marx and Engels. Private property is unnatural and hence not good. All human conflict is caused by considering something as one's own, including one's own wife or children. Note how many communists espoused free love and disparaged the family. The evils only get worse as the entanglements progress. Private property originates in and is magnified by division of labor. Division of labor sets up unnatural social inequality that advances with technological progress. Thus, freedom from crimes, wars, murders, miseries, and horrors will end only if somebody forcibly 
uproots the stakes of private property and drives them into the hearts of the owners. Communism. The main difference between Rousseau and Marx is that Marx thought technology could ultimately provide the kind of idleness and plenty that Rousseau identified only with our original condition. Marx, therefore, believed that human progress through various developmental historical stages could bring us, after the final cataclysmic revolution, to a condition of equality and property-free communism. Marx was not a Rousseau's only revolutionary child. Rousseau is perhaps more famous for spawning a different revolution, the French Revolution. And a closer look at his account of civil society shows us why. As we might have guessed from what's been said above, Rousseau believed that inequalities of private property and the consequent distinction between rich and poor precede the explicit erection of civil society. Some guys in huts work harder, they get more land, their crops flourish, their animals multiply, others are lazier or stricken with bad luck or foolish enough to choose some kind of labor that provides only moderate means. Population increases, society grows, the haves have more, the have lesses have less, the gap between rich and poor grows accordingly. <clears throat> Mere society is transformed into civil society when the few rich realize that many poor can easily band together and overthrow them. They come up with a brilliant scheme. Let us unite, say the rich charlatans to the poor fools, to protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious, and secure for everyone the possession of what belongs to him. Let's institute regulations of justice and peace to which all are obliged to conform. Unquote. What the rich really mean is, quote, let's have laws and the arms to enforce them so that I may keep my riches, unquote. So the poor fools were fooled, laments Rousseau, quote, all ran to meet their chains, thinking they secured their freedom. Such was the origin of society and laws, which gave new fetters to the weak and new forces to the rich, destroyed natural freedom for all time, established forever the law of property and inequality, changed a clever usurpation into an irrevocable right, and for the profit of a few ambitious uh, men, henceforth subjected the hu whole human race to work, servitude, and misery." Unquote. So um, one of the things that i got to remember, and I'm going to hope, I'm going to stop it here, uh, we've got a few more pages left, but that hopefully he's going to get into um, what it is that, uh, it, because on the surface, it seems that Rousseau and Marx are making valid points, but they're wrong on, for, upon further inspection. Basically, then what they're doing is, is specious and or uh, a fallacy. A fallacy is something that appears to be true, uh, but is really false. Okay, and so they're creating various, a, a fallacy or fallacies and, uh, and or acting in a specious manner. Uh, we'll see... Uh, in a future episode, whether or not uh, Mr. Weicker goes ahead and deals with that. If not, then I will. So um, when I come back, I'm going to be reading from uh, the 10 books every conservative must read and one imposter. And thank you very much. So the uh, 10 books uh, every conservative must read in one imposter, uh, kind of in response to a lot of people that had read his book called The 10 Books That Screwed Up the World and Five That Didn't Help. And uh, they asked him, uh, why don't you uh, produce uh, something about what we should read, not just what we shouldn't. Uh, and so this is what he came up with. And uh, right now, uh, what are we doing? Oh, Aristotle is where we're uh, into here. Let's see. Yeah. Aristotle, the man of wisdom and experience. Aristotle was born in uh, Stagira in Greece in 384 BC. His father, Nicomachus, Nico yeah, I can't, I'll say Nicomachus, that'll work. The court was a court physician and advisor to the Macedonian king, Amatus III. Amatus was the father of Philip II, and Philip II was the father of Alexander III, better known as Alexander the Great. All these kings were active in the perpetual wars boiling up in the Greek peninsula, and all, especially Alexander, pushed the conquering reach of Macedon beyond its borders. Alexander was born in 356 BC, and when he turned 13, Aristotle, almost 30 years his senior, became his tutor, and as a reward for his efforts, got Alexander's father Philip to rebuild Stagira, 
one of the many towns the king had beaten to dust. As Alexander was an heir to conquest, Aristotle was an heir to philosophy, and he had brought those riches with him on a rather roundabout route to uh, the royal court of Macedon. He was the third of three great philosophers, certainly the three greatest that ever lived, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle himself. At 17, Aristotle had traveled from Macedonia to Athens, from a nascent empire to one of the numerous independent city-states of the Greek peninsula, the city where Socrates, about 30 years earlier, had been sentenced to death for allegedly corrupting the young with his ideas. Aristotle enrolled in the academy, a school started by Socrates' best pupil, Plato, and studied and taught with Plato for some 20 years, leaving Athens only after Plato's death in 347 BC. Aristotle then emigrated to Asia Minor, where he married Pythias, the adopted daughter of Hermias, a former slave who had become the despotic ruler of the city of Atarnius. Aristotle's influence is credited with moderating and tempering Hermias's tyranny, for Hermias too had studied philosophy with Plato and even with Aristotle himself, and would accept much better of what Aristotle had to say as the better part of wisdom. Aristotle even arranged an alliance between Hermias and Philip of Macedon. That turned to ashes, however, when Hermias was kidnapped by a Persian ally, clapped in chains, and tortured to reveal Philip's plans for the invasion of Asia Minor. He refused to betray his friends and died in 341 uh, BC. Before Hermias met his death, Aristotle had traveled to Lesbos, an island in the northeastern Aegean where he had gone to study biology. His method there was typical of the man. He did not sit on a rock by the sea and dream up grand theories of the universe and the origin and destiny of life, but got down in the water and looked for himself at what living things actually did, cut them up to see what they were really made of, and looked to experienced fishermen rather than philosophers to learn about the details of sea life. It was in 342 that Philip called Aristotle to Macedon to become a tutor to young Alexander and other important Macedonian nobles. And it seems that Aristotle's influence carried all the way into Philip's own policies, especially encouraging leniency toward Athens. After Philip was assassinated in 336, his son Alexander was proclaimed king by the Macedonian army. He was only 20. Aristotle left for Athens and remained there for nearly the rest of his life. Over the next decade, while Alexander was conquering Asia Minor, Syria, Egypt, Persia, and stretching towards India, Aristotle was in Athens philosophizing, starting his own school, the Lyceum. Most of his, uh, the works we have uh, from him come from this period. When Alexander the Great died in 323 from poison, malaria, typhoid fever, pancreatitis, overeating the medicinal plant, helleborn, heavy drinking, or complications from a previous wound, you can take your pick. Um, the immediate result was predictable. With removal of the heavy hand of Macedonian rule, Athens rebelled, and Aristotle, the royal intimate of Macedonian kings, came under charges of impiety at Athens, the very same kind of charge that brought the Athenians to serve Hemlock to Socrates three quarters of a century earlier. Aristotle fled to the Chalcis, a Macedonian stronghold on the island of Euboea, his mother's native soil, where he died in 322. Aristotle's politics, written while he was in Athens teaching at the Lyceum, is an expansive treatise and rests firmly upon his formidable intellect and his deep and long experience of political life. Unfortunately, we cannot possibly cover the entire argument of the politics in a single summary chapter. By unearthing some of its riches, I hope I can induce readers to do further digging on their own. But it is important to remember that when Aristotle wrote about politics, he did so as someone who had been at the very center of of political intrigue and jostling empires. His starting point is neither utopian, dreaming up airy schemes about the way things ought to be, nor does he take the snake's eye view of real politique, later made famous by Machiavelli. Instead, Aristotle begins where political life begins, in the natural moral order of human life, <clears throat> Excuse me, and ends where it ought to end, in making us better than we were, even though we fall far short of the angels. And the next section is we call the natural foundation of political life. So uh, he is, um, Mr. Weicker is uh, saying that one of the books that a conservative must read is 
uh, Aristotle's politics. So um, I would think that there's got to be, because again, I've read some from some of Aristotle's works and uh, it's quite a slog. Um, he's very detailed and whatnot. And so it might be better for the audience, if you wanted to read about that, is to find uh, books that review or summarize or perhaps even analyze uh, his works uh, to give you kind of a head start and uh, get into it that way. There might be, I know there is a an icon slash totem book. Icon and totem are the, um, um, I want to say producers, but it is the publishers. And one in the United Kingdom and one in the United States, and they produce a series called Introducing. So you have Introducing Philosophy, Introducing Ethics, and there is a book called Introducing Aristotle. So that's also a good way to get in, in into this without having to, uh, you know, uh, dive into the deep end, so to speak, to give a uh, picture, uh, do a little verbal picture painting there. So um, when I come back, uh, I think a few jokes from the New York City cab driver's joke book are in order. Thank you very much. Heard any good ones lately? Jim Peach, a real New York City cabbie, has heard them all, from business people, unemployed laborers, Wall Street lawyers, prostitutes, writers, tourists, drug dealers, and lovers, all from the back seat of his cab as he makes his way around New York City. Jim always asks his customers for their best jokes, and here are his favorites. More than 400 clean jokes, dirty jokes, ethnic jokes, religious jokes, dirty Ernie jokes, jokes about musicians, bartenders, hookers, everyone. New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book also includes the true stories about Jim's writers and original illustrations by Jim himself, the cabbie with the best collection of jokes in New York City. A family got in my cab one evening, a husband, his wife, and their teenage daughter. As we exchanged jokes for a while, I was, of course, limiting my selections to only clean ones. When I got to uh, got them to Tavern on the Green, the man sitting nearest the door got out first, then the daughter As the wife slid across the back seat to get out, she paused a moment to lean over and say quietly into my ear, Do you know why the Polish man didn't enjoy his honeymoon? No, I said, because he was waiting for the swelling to go down, she said before getting out and rejoining her family. A little boy goes to the counter in a drugstore and asks the clerk for a box of Tampax. The clerk puts them into the paper bag and says to the boy, Are these for your mommy? No, says the boy. Well then, says the clerk, are they for your sister? Uh, uh uh-uh, says the boy. Well, then, says the clerk, who are they for? They're for me, says the boy. For you, says the surprised clerk. What are you going to do with them? I don't know yet, says the boy. All I know is that I keep seeing on TV that if you buy these, you can go horseback riding, swimming, camping. What's the difference between a pig and a fox? About four drinks. And on that note, uh, we come to the conclusion of another episode of of the drill. And until next time, thank you very much for listening and have a great day.